Hey guys, welcome back to Project Tube. If you're new here, I'm Project. You'll notice in a lot of my recent casting videos, I skipped the burnout process completely. And there's a couple reasons for that. One, it's boring, it takes all day. But the other reason is I have a pretty ghetto burnout kiln. But I figured there's a lot of you guys out there that are like me, you don't have a lot of money to spend in this hobby. And so I thought it'd be useful to make a video showing you how you can turn a toaster oven into a burnout kiln. Now, keep in mind, this isn't a permanent solution, it's not even a great solution, but it does work and it will give you results while you perfect your casting skills. So let's get started. Now the quick backstory on this toaster oven is we had it for many years and it worked great. About last December, this timer started sticking and it would burn your food. So I threw it out in the garage, I figured I'll lubricate the timer and then it'll work fine. But then I got the idea of would it work as a burnout kiln? So today I'm gonna go over the modifications that I made. I have some new modifications to automate the process and then we're going to go ahead and invest, burn out and cast this skull model right here. The first thing I did is I had a bunch of leftover one inch ceramic fiber insulation that was left over from the smoker foundry build. If you haven't seen that video, I'll leave a link up over here. I just simply lined the inside of this toaster oven with that using sodium silicate, which I also had left over. You can get on Amazon. I'll leave link, all links in the description. I literally glued the fiber insulation onto all sides of the toaster oven, including the glass front and I removed, there were some grills along that covered these elements, and I removed those as well. Now, keep in mind, as I said in the beginning of this video, this is not a, a long-term solution. These elements, I don't know if you can tell in the video, but I'll give you a shot of it later, maybe clip it in here. They are oxidizing and you know, basically wearing away. And this has probably five or six burnouts on it, I'll probably get 20 or 30 out of it, and then I'll have to replace the elements. But elements are cheap on Amazon, 20 bucks for three of them. Again, link in the description. So that's not a huge issue. The next thing that needed to be modified was this over temperature sensor right here. I found that this would kick off the kiln when it reached about a thousand degrees. So I simply jumpered it, wired it right here. These both went to that sensor and I just put a jumper wire in between. It seems to work fine. And now it doesn't cut off at a thousand degrees. Now, one thing you might be asking yourself is, well, hey, Project, how did you know it was at 1,000 degrees? For about 60 bucks off Amazon, you can get this K-type therm uh, thermometer with this K-type uh, temperature sensor. These are about 30 bucks a piece, or you can get the combo for, I think, about 60. Link will be in the description. And so I just drilled a hole on the side of the toaster oven, stuck this guy in there, and monitored the temperature that way. Now, keep in mind, let's go into what a burnout process looks like and why this, while worked, was not ideal. So here is a typical burnout schedule. Some of them differ depending on the type of investment you're using, uh, a couple hours here, or the different temperatures, or maybe one extra step. But in general, uh, you ramp up over an hour to 3.02. Uh, you hold that for three hours, ramp up to 6.98 over an hour, hold that for two hours, ramp up to 13.82 over two hours, and hold that for four hours, total 13 hour process. Now, this is all day, obviously. I usually can get away with 12 hours holding uh, at 1382 for three hours and the kiln, the toaster oven kiln doesn't typically get to 1382. Usually it's about 1300, but I've had fine results with that. So as you can see with the toaster oven kiln, I've had to babysit this all day because the temperature controls that come on the toaster oven obviously aren't made to go to these kinds of temperatures. And as I said before, the timer was kind of bogus. It, kind of works off and on so this is why I was looking at other options and for a computerized controller to kind of manage this process so as you can see the whole burnout process is pretty extensive and it takes all day and I got tired of babysitting this kiln turning it on and off keeping the proper temperature for the right amount of time it was an all-day process and I just didn't have that time every weekend to, to do that before I cast. So I got on Amazon and found this computerized temperature controller that lets me set programs of the whole process, turn it on and it'll just run. It was about $70, so not terribly cheap, but I think well worth the time saved. I needed a thermocoupler to hook up to it, which I already have, and a SSSR solid state re relay to control it as well. So today we're gonna be installing that onto the toaster oven and computerizing this whole process. 
One of the things I'm going to be doing when I add the controller is I'm gonna turn this whole assembly on in like this. And the reason I'm doing that is before this four inch flask would barely fit in here. And I have larger ones on order that are taller and have a larger diameter that literally would just not fit in the way that it was previously. This way I have plenty of height in here for larger flasks and it just makes more sense. We can mount the controller up here after we take all these switches off and get rid of all these electronics that we don't need anymore and that'll work just great. All right, we got most of the electronics removed, all that we needed to. So we got power in right over here. We got the top element the bottom element in the back and the top element and bottom element in the front. The other side are just linked in series, so these are just connected on the other side. Uh, so we just need to provide 120 volts to each of these and we'll be good to go. That'll work. Now we gotta get the solid state relay mounted and then everything wired up and then this thing programmed, which I hear is not a fun thing to do. All right, I think I have everything wired up. Uh, this thing runs off of, the temperature controller runs off of, I think 32 to 230 volts AC or DC, I believe. Uh, so that's just hooked into the 110. We have two wires that go on the low voltage side to trigger the solid state relay. We have the elements, heating elements, that are wired in parallel on uh, both sides to the high voltage side of the solid state relay. And we have the thermocouple, which wires into the temperature controller. Uh, be careful on that one because uh, it's marked red as right here, but that's not positive, it's actually negative. Uh, I actually wired all of this up and then realized that I put this little collar that holds this controller in in backwards. I took everything else off, flipped the collar around, put it back on, wired everything back up, and this collar still doesn't work. So I'm going to have to figure out how to get this thing to stay in there properly. But let's go ahead and plug it on, plug it in, and see if this thing works. And sure enough, it's lighting up. So now I have to do the programming, which I've heard is not very good. The instructions aren't very good, but I'm gonna try to see if I can get it done and we'll check back. So I'm doing a little test on it right now. You guys can't see it because the refresh rate on that little LED screen, but it's supposed to be ramping up to 302 degrees over the course of an hour. It looks like it's doing it. I put in the programming, uh, but it's like I said, it's a little difficult to understand these instructions over here. Uh, while it was, we're testing it, I went ahead and sprued up the model. So now I'm gonna go ahead and invest it and then we can stick it in this burnout kiln and see if it works. Okay, I think I have it programmed properly. I tested it out, seems to be working good. It was a little funny how the, you program it, but I, I got the hang of it and it's actually not as difficult as I thought. I uh, went ahead and ordered more fiber insulation. I didn't think it was gonna come for this video, but it just got delivered. So I'm gonna add another layer of fiber insulation to help insulate this thing. And then the other thing I'm gonna do is add some of this HT100, or I guess another word for it, or name for it would be Mr. Volcano. This was what I had left over from the foundry smoke, smoker foundry build. Uh, it's all dried up. So keep an eye, maybe put it in a bag or something if you have some left over. Uh, so I got some more of that stuff. That stuff's not cheap, but it is works really, really good to reflect the heat back inside I found on my foundry. And then I'll use the sodium silicate to glue that fiber insulation onto the sides here. I'm gonna clean this all out. And uh, it's always a good idea to use something like this when you're using the fiber insulation because you don't want those particles coming off and breathing them in. I typically will wear a respirator when I'm doing this type of stuff, uh, but this helps keep those fibers stuck down to where you want and then it reflects that heat a lot better. So that's the next step and then the mold is drying right now. I think it's just about dry, and then I'll stick it in there for the burnout. Good morning, boys and girls. It's the next morning. Didn't have enough time to start the burnout yesterday, 
uh, and I applied all the HT100, which you need to let kind of dry. So I started the burnout process this morning. Uh, it's been about an hour. I came out here, and one of the pieces that I adhered to the top, I don't know if you can tell, it's right there, that, that piece right there fell off. So the sodium silicate did not adhere it. So that's why I have this thing upside down. I applied more sodium silicate. Put this thing upside down, put it on some blocks uh, because I added a fan to it. So this should be the top, but I need that thing to stick and uh, I need to continue this burnout process. So I have it upside down. We'll do the rest of this burnout with it upside down and hopefully by the end that thing will have adhered itself to it. If not, I'll figure something out. I was trying to insulate the top of it because heat rises, right? And uh, that's where all the electronics are. So anyways, I'll check on back in when we get closer to the higher temperatures and we'll see if we can cast this thing. All right, we're getting into the higher temps of the burnout. I don't know if you guys can read upside down, but that's 1206 degrees right now. So we're reaching the, the end phases of the burnout. I'm just gonna open this up, give you a quick look inside. Uh, I don't want to let out all the heat, but here you go. Typically the flask wouldn't be tipped over kind of on the side like that, but that's because I have this thing upside down, but it'll work either way. Uh, the next thing we'll get doing is the casting. All right, boys and girls, it is the next day. The flask is completely burnt out. There's a slight crack. I don't know if you guys can tell right at the hole there. Uh, I've had that before. It didn't affect the cast at all, but I don't like to see cracks like that. The kiln is looking good. I don't know if you guys can really see. The top portion that fell off before is stuck well now. The uh, HT or 100 HT, I've been pronouncing it wrong this whole video, but the 100 HT is all cured up on there and the thing looks pretty good. So the next step is to throw this thing back in here, get it up to casting temperature and then melt up some metal and cast this thing. Dinner's pretty much ready. Okay. And can I have one soda? Sure. Now, as you might have gathered from my very enthusiastic response to my daughter asking for orange soda with dinner, I was a little miffed when I took this out of the quenching water 
One, because not all the investment went away when I quenched it. And two, we didn't get a complete fill in the back of the skull. I suspect that the temperature of the flask was not correct, but it could be that the computerized controller is not reporting the correct temperature. I usually do it to 1100. I did it to 1050, 1050 degrees this time, but either way, we didn't get enough fill. If you've casted anything before, you know, you just set yourself up for disappointment because oftentimes this is what happens. I've kind of lucked out the last two castings. They were completely successful and they were intricate. And as well as this one was intricate, but in this case, we did not get a complete fill. Now on that note, we got the new larger flask, which does fit in the toaster oven kiln. So let me know in the comments, guys, if you want to see me recast this bigger and better in the new flask. And as always, Thanks for watching.